Good morning, everyone. Today we have a very special guest, Deja Fox. I am honored to introduce her. She is a youth activist, organizer, the founder of Gen Z Girl King, and what she always says, the future president of the United States. Welcome, Deja. Hi, thanks for having me on. It's so wonderful to be able to catch up on screen. I feel like so much of this time, I mean, we have much more time and much less time. Uh, but one of the great opportunities is that we have moments like this to slow down and, and have conversations with inspiring people like you to empower other young people. Because this is this is a, a very, un, I would say, unprecedented time is the word that we're saying. And more Gen Zs are in limbo than ever. And so today, I think the main goal of this 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 episode and this time is for me to better know you and get to know you story because you've overcome financial hardship in a way that I think very few young Gen Z leaders have been able to. And and with that, I'd love for you to talk to me a little bit how you went from literally you know, being homeless to working on Kamala Harris's campaign and, and achieving all of the things that you've done. I want to just kind of go back 20 years and, and have you set that scene for us. Yeah. So that being said, I just turned 20 last weekend um, and said goodbye to my teenage years. Uh, but taking us back, I was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I was raised by a single mom who barely graduated high school, uh, who hopped from job to job and often experienced a lot of financial insecurity growing up. Things like paying the rent, putting food on the table, paying electricity. Those were the kinds of conversations I was having at a really young age. Um, and so as I got older, right, things in my household started to deteriorate a little bit. And there was issues of substance abuse that entered the picture in addition to this financial insecurity. And at 15, I ended up moving out. So like you said, I experienced what one in 30 teens actually experienced called hidden homelessness, where I was living with friends and staying with people in my circle. Uh, and it wasn't as apparent as it might be to a lot of folks, right? A lot of people, when they think of homelessness, they think of living on the streets or maybe in a shelter. Uh, but actually, all the more common for young people is living in limbo with their friends and family. Um, and so that's where I was at. Uh, and I ended up turning that experience actually into the activism work that you all see today. Um, having experienced homelessness, not having parents at home. I saw firsthand how the sex education system in my school district was built to disadvantage students like me. So I started getting active and that only grew from there. Uh, and I started using my story as an agent for change making. Um, and you can see that from the very beginning, fighting for sex ed to a viral moment with Jeff Flake, where I asked why he is a white man, has power to make choices about me and my body, or even making it to Columbia University where so much of uh, the college process is dependent on your ability to tell your story. Um, and, you know, it's carried me even into the work that I do today as the influencer and surrogate strategist on the Kamala Harris campaign. Every day I was on the phone with other people talking about why it was that my story connected to hers and how I could see um, so much power in their stories and what their communities uh, would bring to this campaign and this fight. Wow. I still can't believe you're just 20 years old. And I think one of the things that I'm so curious about for you is how did you empower yourself or what drove you to believe and truly believe that you could rewrite your story? Yeah. Oh, that's such a hard question. Um, I think one of the hardest things uh, is really believing in yourself, right? Um, I think our possibilities are as limitless as we make them. I did know sort of intention wise, what direction I wanted to go. Um, and I knew I wanted to have my own financial stability, right? I knew I wanted to move out of my hometown and experience something different. And education had always been a really stable uh, place for me, right? It was like a second home. Um, and so I had always seen education as sort of my way out. Um, no, I don't necessarily see it that way. Um, but growing up, it was kind of the North Star. Um, and so a lot of my ability to sort of create the social mobility for myself came from my ability 
to work hard and do well in school. Um, and you know, it was a huge jumping off point when at 18, I was still working in a gas station. I'd worked there for two years since a week after I turned 16 until I moved to New York. It was a huge shift. The year, um, I quit my gas station job, moved to New York, uh, to start going to school at Columbia. One year after I quit that gas station job, I was in Paris with Nike for the women's world cup. Um, and that kind of social mobility, it doesn't happen every day, right? Uh, and so much of that was tied to the privilege of being able to pursue higher education and go um, to a school like Columbia, where I was then surrounded by such a resource-rich environment. Uh, and was pushed to see myself as capable of more and bigger. Wow. I mean, I'm fascinated by that story because that was quite literally only two years ago that you were working in a gas station. And yeah, yeah, so, totally. You're on billboards and stages and impacting young people quite literally all over the world. But with that, I'm curious what role social media played in social mobility. Was it seeing other people's stories? Was it a tool that you used? Because I think that that... I'm curious because I think social media was a big part of my drive and my ability to see that there was mobility, whatever that looks like. And I'm so curious how that affected you and how that brought you to where you are today because you use social media in such a powerful way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm someone who grew up with social media for better or for worse, right? I got my first Facebook at 11, my Twitter at like 12. Right. And I was saying all kinds of things that need not be said online because my view of the internet actually growing up through most of my teenage years, I wasn't even thinking about the world outside of my community via social media. So much of it was how do I impress this person or how do I get to know the person at this other school or that cute guy? Right. And I, I hadn't even really thought of social media as this ability to connect me to the world larger than home, because I never really thought of the world as larger than home. Uh, I was someone who didn't often get to travel, right? I, uh, I wasn't, there weren't people around me going on business trips to blah, 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 and catching a plane to so-and-so. I was someone whose life was very much centered around the people I knew in my community who I grew up with. Um, and there was sort of an idea in my hometown that this is the kind of place you're born and you stay forever. Um, and it wasn't until my moment with Jeff Flake, uh, where my story went from, you know, the few, there was maybe a thousand people in the town hall that day. Um, and my story went from a few, like maybe a thousand people hearing it to millions, right? Nearly, I think like 17, 18 million people. Um, and then being on CNN that next night and realizing just how much bigger the world was, how much bigger this fight was um, than just me and my hometown and the organizers I knew. Um, and when so many people heard my story, resonated with me, um, it affirmed something in me, which I already knew, which was that my power was my story and my experience. And since then, you know, moving to New York from Arizona was not easy. Like I said, my world was, was pretty small. Um, and it got so much bigger, so much quicker. Um, going to a school at Columbia was not easy. I was used, I, the, my vision of rich or wealthy transformed in ways I couldn't have even imagined once I got to Columbia. Um, and so I was fighting with understanding all of these things while also trying to find my community. And I ended up founding Gen Z Girl Gang because I started to realize so much of what was my community now, who I'm accountable to, who I share experience with actually were people that I was engaging with online. Um, and so I really started to translate my skills as a community builder and organizer uh, to this digital space. And I found a lot of fulfillment and um, a lot of my work there now. That is fantastic. And I've been following along your work and I, the work that you've done to date is so powerful. And I think that Gen Z Girl Gang is a phenomenal example of what social media can be used for positive way. Um, I, I'm curious, what is your relationship with social media now? I think it's, you know, oh, man. It's, it's such, it depends on the day for sure. But I, I'm curious because you've 
really take advantage of it as a tool, but you're also very much so in the center of so much attention. And there's also immense amount of responsibility that happens. And so I'm, I'm so curious, how, what is your relationship to it? You know, the vast majority of my income comes from things related to social media, whether it's posts on my own account, right? Um, or doing digital strategy work for campaigns or brands or organizations. So much of what I do is based in what's happening on my phone. So in that way, I struggle and I'm really trying, especially now that we're in quarantine, to set limits with myself about how it is that I engage with social media um, on a personal level and on a professional level. Um, And it hasn't been easy. Uh, It's the source of a lot of anxiety for me, but it is also where I connect, right? It's it's where I meet new people. Some of my best friends I've met and my leadership team, I've met and sustained relationships with. Uh, even my job on the Kamala Harris campaign, the very first inquiry I got about that job came to me via Instagram. And I was like, maybe. Packed up my life, moved to Baltimore and did it. And so social media, it's this constant battle. Of like, when is it isolating me from my real life? And how is it you know, also making my life fuller and richer and more engaged. And it's like these scales that are constantly moving back and forth. Social media, when I was younger, and I wanted to be a fashion blogger initially, a long time ago, (laughs) uh, when I was in college, similarly, that was how I started building my personal brand. And I started getting income. I saved up when I was in school, while I was consulting and doing a lot of things so that I could move to New York. And I... I think that that is something that young people can really tap into during this time to find their voice and find their people and find the platform that works for them. Uh, So many young people are in limbo. And I'm curious, what advice do you have for young people who quite literally are in limbo, have an apartment, might be about to run out of money, and don't know what to do? Because I think it's all about taking small steps. And we're very much so in a fight or flight situation. And you've, you've been at a place where it's between live or die or, you know, getting ramen and not having dinner. And so what did you do at rock bottom? Because so many young people are there right now. I think something that's really important for me um, is an understanding that you can be struggling and succeeding at the same time, right? And I think Oftentimes when I talk about my story um, in terms of getting from homelessness to higher education and working on a presidential campaign, it's really important to stress that at the same time I was homeless and working at the gas station, I also had gone viral, right? I also spent time working and lobbying on Capitol Hill. It was in the offices of members of Congress. And so in that way, and I think this goes really nicely to your organization and message is that you really, you can be struggling and succeeding at the same time. And people may not be seeing the struggle because they're seeing your success. And I think that that's one of the tricks of social media is we're only comfortable sharing our struggles once we've overcome them. Um, and so what I would say to young people who are currently struggling is don't be scared to ask for help, right? Don't be scared to talk about the struggle while you're in it. Because one thing that I found when I was experiencing homelessness was Yes, it's so much harder to talk about a struggle before you've overcome it. But when you talk about it and when you share with other people, that's when they have the ability to help you, right? To step up, to support you, to catch you. Um, and if I hadn't talked about my, my experience with homelessness, I wouldn't have found a family willing to take me in longer term. I wouldn't have been able to win on a school board level for sex education reform unless I'd shared my story. And then in turn, by sharing my story, inspired other young people to come and share theirs, right? And so though it's harder to share your story as it's happening, as as you're struggling, I think it's imperative that we do so not only for our own success, but for the success of those around us and our communities. Thank you for sharing that. I commend you because sharing your story also comes with a a lot of courage. And that can be relatively challenging to access, especially during times of emotional distress. And so I'm curious how you were able to, what sort of things or routines or or actions did you take to reshape the way that you thought about these challenges? Because I think that that is 
the, really the first step is seeing these challenges as an opportunity to move forward if you make the right ask. But opening your mouth to make the ask is so hard. Like even as someone that has to fundraise, I have to prepare myself before getting on a phone <laughs> yeah. call to remind myself that I need to make an ask and I can't dance around it. How did you do that at such a young age? Like, how did you set up the conversation? How did you get over, you know, these feelings of, you know, feeling less than like you were so young when you did this? Yeah, no, I was, I was a baby for sure. Um, though in some ways I feel like I've aged backwards almost like I'm allowing myself to be a teenager now that I'm 20. Um, totally. <laughs> but when I was 15 and 16, I want to make it really clear to people listening that I was not as skilled at telling my story then as I am now, right? It takes practice. The things that people had taught me to hide, right? The things that society had said were shameful, only carried shame if I let them. And that my circumstances were through no fault of my own. Um, and even if they were, it, it wouldn't be something shameful to share. Um, and that when I was able to reclaim those experiences with poverty and homelessness, I was able to really reclaim my own power in my narrative. Um, and I think seeing the power of my story, that's when I began to mobilize and to help other people see the power in their story, right? Um, and one piece of advice I always give people uh, when thinking about um, sort of sharing their stories is that I always encourage people to be uncomfortable, but not unsafe. It was uncomfortable for me to get up in front of that school board. I won't pretend that it was easy. Over time, my, my abilities and my comfort grew. And so I was able to grow my impact um, and scale my efforts. Uh, so be uncomfortable, but not unsafe in the way that you tell your story. And I always, my best speaking advice is that, and this is something I'm still learning today, but the best speaking advice I ever have received and been able to share is that People will not remember everything you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. Um, and so don't sweat every little detail. They don't need to know every little piece. What you're trying to share with them is how it felt. And you're trying to make them you know, move from emotions of fear to maybe inspiration, inaction to action. Um, and they won't do that unless they feel a connection. I mean, even just speaking to you, I can feel that that empathy, that power, and that inspiration. And I think that that is one of your, your gifts, is your ability to translate that not only on stage, but also through the screen, which is, quite frankly, a, a very interesting new normal that I'm personally trying to navigate. So I, I love that. And I think that that's really the power that Gen Zs have as these digital natives, because we learned how to, some might agree, connect and emote on technology before we actually reckoned with our own stories in real life. And that is what makes this tool so powerful right now. Um, what does financial wellness mean to you? And what does digital wellness mean to you? And do they fit together? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, in my life, I think digital wellness and financial wellness do fit together in that so much of my finances are actually tied to the way that I engage online. And I think I would define financial wellness for myself um, as ever evolving, right? At 16, what financial wellness looked like for me was very different than what I, I think of even now. Um, I think having my own apartment um, and money in my savings, um, these things uh, have offered me so much stability now that from this place of stability, I'm starting to reassess, right? What does financial stability look like for me in the next five or 10 years? Um, and as someone who doesn't come from a background um, of financial literacy, right? My mom growing up didn't even have a debit card or a credit card. Um, and so I'm learning all of this for the very first time and I'm doing it, I would say, sort of on my own, right? I'm using technology to learn about what are money markets and savings and how do I grow my money. But I'm also leaning on my community um, and finding people who are willing to talk to me and help me through it and help me understand. Um, and so financial wellness for me at its very core um, is freedom and choice um, and the ability to live a life characterized by those things. 
um, and not hindered by my financial situation. And I'm doing it by looking online, finding my own resources, by learning on my own, and by leaning on my community to help me understand. Uh, and then digital wellness for me, um, again, always evolving because these digital platforms are evolving and the way that I engage with them also is always changing. But I think for me, it is understanding that social media is always and will always be a tactic for me, whether it's a tactic for organizing and winning a, a legislative battle or a campaign um, or to building community that translates to offline connection um, or to the ability to uh, see each other more fully and share my story, or maybe even just to uh, see new possibilities, right? Whatever it is, I want social media and the digital realm for me to always be a tactic to something else um, and a means of achieving. Um, I don't think that there's any sense in doing anything that doesn't get you to your ultimate goal and that goal should be happiness. That's where I have to draw the boundaries of it. As we leave this conversation, how can everyone stay in touch with you and the amazing yeah. work you're doing? Um, so you can find me at Deja Fox, D-E-J-A-F-O-X-X. Um, and you can follow my organization at Gen Z Girl Gang. Um, we're always looking to bring new folks into our communities. Um, and I really do admire uh, and value and appreciate every single one of the people that make up those communities in my life. So do join, hang out with me. Thank you.